Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Easter Sunday, for so many people, is a big deal. But what is the big deal? Why are so many people fascinated by this particular day? I'm sure that all around the world, right now, people are celebrating Easter in all kinds of ways, uh, all kinds of ceremonies, all kinds of traditions. And I've got a picture here which maybe sums up what a modern Easter looks like to a lot of people. It's like my generic world Easter, okay, if you like. So um, I don't always know where some of these come from. And there's a lot of theories about where the traditions of Easter come from. But um, I've done a little bit of research, and so I'll give you some theories on, on why we celebrate as we do. Uh, one big thing about Easter, you must have noticed, is eggs. Egg seems to be a huge theme of every single Easter. And one of the things I, I read about was that the egg was particularly the shape of a seed and also a raindrop. Now, bearing in mind that Easter happens every spring, it's always in spring, isn't it? Never in autumn or winter. It suggests that the egg reminds us that it's the time that new stuff grows. And seeds and rain, of course, are, are, are crucial if we're going to see new things growing. Um, I've also got a picture here of painted eggs. Now, when I was a, a kid, a long time ago, I remember painting eggs. We used to do that. I don't know why, but we used to paint eggs and make them very beautiful. We also used to take those eggs and roll them down hills. Now, I've no idea why we did that. It seems a shame, especially after you've put so much effort into painting them. But again, one theory is that uh, as spring comes, there's this new explosion of color. The winter is over, uh, the, the bleakness and the light lifelessness uh, and the, the drabness of winter is gone and now in spring there's this explosion of colour as new life comes in plants and, and on blossoms and flowers. You've noticed it probably even driving in, the, the blossoms on the trees and so maybe that's why people celebrated by painting their eggs. Now, you may have gathered, if you don't know me, that I'm from England uh, by my accent. And one of the big traditions in England, and I'm not sure if it happens over here, is for a Good Friday breakfast for people to have hot cross buns. And hot cross buns are like a sweet bread, uh, and, and they have this cross that's put on top and baked. Uh, and it's to remind us, really, of what Jesus did on Good Friday when he died on the cross. Chicks, for some reason, are also a big deal at Easter. And again, I think that the simple reason is that's what comes out of eggs. And again, you get this idea, new life. New life is what happens. Also, have you noticed how many lambs there are springing? Maybe not in Santa Clara, but uh, <laughs> certainly uh, in the countryside, lambs are a big thing. There's new life everywhere. And of course, the Easter bunny. We mustn't forget about the Easter bunny because it's good to celebrate. Celebrating is good, all these things. But my worry is sometimes that the celebrations can get in the way of maybe what the bigger picture is. I read one theory about where the Easter bunny came from, and believe me, there's a lot of theories. And one particular theory was that uh, a German lady used to hide eggs in her garden for, people, for her children to find. And every year she did this, and the children didn't know who hid them, and so they would run around the garden trying to find these eggs. And then one day, a rabbit happened to hop by, and they just made the connection that maybe it was the rabbit who hid the eggs in the first place. Now, I'm not judging. I'm not judging. That was just one of the theories. And then, of course, eggs, chocolate eggs. Now, uh, many years ago, one tradition was that uh, people would bring baskets, baskets of food to a church on a Sunday, on Easter Sunday, that it might be distributed to the poor. And as time went on, that tradition kind of got modified so that people instead would bring candy and sweets and chocolate to children. Uh, and so it was a way of blessing children because, of course, chocolate was seen as a symbol of blessing. All wonderful things and things that we enjoy things that help us celebrate Easter, but do they get in the way of really what the message of Easter is? Because it's only when we take some of these things away and remove them that we get more of an idea of perhaps what God wants us to think about at Easter time. Sorry to take the bunny away, I know he's a great favourite. We're left with two eggs, two eggs with ribbons round, and it's only when we remove the ribbons and take away the sky, maybe, that we're left with one big picture of what God says Easter is about. The eggs are great, aren't they? But much more important is the fact that here is a picture of an empty tomb with the stone rolled away. What God would have us know 
is that the resurrection of Jesus is the big deal. The resurrection of Jesus is him coming back to life after being put to death on Good Friday. And the great message for every one of us is that if we trust in Jesus, we too are raised to life through what Jesus did. And that is a big deal. You know, that's a message that resonates, I think, with every single human being. In England, I used to go into schools, public schools, and give a gospel message. And I was allowed to do that. In England, you can still do that. And at Easter time, I would go in and I would speak to the children about what happens to us after we die. And, and imagine a room of 500 elementary kids, unruly, mischievous, misbehaving, shouting out. And when I mentioned what happens to us after we die you could have heard a pin drop. And everyone leaned in to listen because they were thinking, here's a guy who's going to give us an answer that no one's ever given us before. Well, it's not me giving the answer. It's the message of God, the message of hope that's given to each one of us. But what I notice is that as we grow older and we stop being children, cynicism kicks in, doesn't it? And we ask ourselves rightly, well, how can I really believe this? This is a great story, but how can I know that it's true? What is there about the story of the resurrection that I can believe? You know, I think we would love it if Jesus just popped out and said, hey, guys, I am here. It's true. But he doesn't do that. And he's never done that. He never will do that. And for those of us just sitting back saying, well, I'll believe when it's proven to me, I think we've got a long wait. And it could be a very disastrous wait. But what Jesus does in Scripture is he says, I will give you evidence for those who have eyes to see. And so I just want to quickly share a second story with you. And it's not a particularly an Easter story, but it's a story that does help us understand what Jesus would have us believe today. Now, here you can see a packed room, okay? This is a, a story set in, in the early part of Mark's gospel. In Mark chapter 2, the Bible says that in a town called Capernaum, someone was coming to a house. So important that the house was packed out. Well, of course, it's Jesus. Jesus is coming, and he is going to be in this house speaking to the people. Now, already in Mark's gospel, Jesus has established that he's here on earth to share the word of God, to bring the word of God of life uh, to people uh, that they might know God. And he wants people to get into the kingdom of God. He wants them to know what the gospel is, that their lives might be changed. And as he preaches the word, already in Mark's gospel, we read that nobody ever spoke like like this man, because he comes with an authority and a knowledge about things that nobody's ever been able to talk about before. He's already healed all kinds of people. He's cast out demons. And so the message and the knowledge of who he is has gone before him. And so when the people know he's going to be at this house, they pack it out because they're thinking to themselves, we want to see another celebration. We want to see more people healed, more demons cast out. We, maybe he'll bring us some magical food from heaven. Who knows what he'll do, but we want to be there to be part of this great event. But Jesus says, no, I'm not here to do that. My job, he says, and the Bible says this, he comes to bring the word to them. And I love that about Jesus, that he refuses to be diverted. Despite what other people's agenda is, he says, no, I'm coming for what I need to give you. And so he preaches about how a person gets into the kingdom of God. And the word of God involves the fact that we can't know God because of our sin. And sin, you know, it's a funny word, isn't it? We, we, we get very hung up about it. But essentially, sin is that attitude that's in each one of us that opposes God, that makes us an enemy of God, that says, I don't want to do what God wants to do. I want to do things my way. And what Jesus' work is, is to reverse that in us, that we might become God's friends and that we might be with him forever. So Jesus, and I'm sure to the disappointment of many there, he is there to preach the word. And as the people are listening, suddenly something strange starts to happen because there is a hole in the roof. Now, it's not because the house was badly made. It's not because uh, the, uh, the builders in, in Israel at that time weren't very good. It's because somebody is on the roof and they're making a hole in it. Now, you can imagine that if I was trying to preach now and, and the roof started falling in, I wouldn't have a lot of your attention. But as the roof continues to become bigger, as this hole increases in size, the people there realize that someone's on the roof 
And in fact, it's four people who have brought their friend with them who the Bible says is a paralytic. This guy has never been able to move. He can't use his arms and his legs. They've got him on a stretcher and they are about to lower him. Okay. And as the people look up, they recognize who this man is. They know he's a local guy. They know him from, from probably his youth. And they think, great, oh, we don't have to listen to this stuff about sin anymore. Now we're going to get to see a healing. This is, a, this is going to be wonderful. Here we have this chance to celebrate again. And as the men just put their arms through, what they do is they lower this guy down. <laughs> so they lower him down. Here he comes. Who said we? Did someone say we? <laughs> He's lowered. He's lowered down to the ground. Probably very carefully, just as I did. I didn't want to drop him. Okay, so he's lowered to the ground. But instead of healing him, Jesus does a very strange thing. He looks at the faith of the four friends, and bearing in mind this man was probably so ill and in such desperate needs that they had to get him prepared and they had to carry him and they probably had to take it gently because his situation was so desperate. Of course he's late and of course there's no room left in, in, in the house, which is why they have to take such drastic measures. But Jesus doesn't moan at them. He doesn't say, what do you think you're doing to that roof? He loves the fact that they have shown such great faith. And it's one of my favorite stories. If ever you want to see what faith looks like, people who really trust in Jesus and say, I'm so convinced of what Jesus can do in my life that I'll even take someone's roof apart, there's a picture of it. But Jesus looks at the man and he refuses to be diverted from what he's preaching about. So rather than just say, I'm going to heal this guy, he says, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I reckon that caused a bombshell in that room. First of all, I think there was disappointment from people who said, no, we didn't come here to see sins forgiven. We wanted to see this man healed. There'd be other people there who were murmuring and mumbling in their hearts, saying to themselves, who is this who says he can forgive sins? Because only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knows what they're thinking. You know, Jesus sees this man's real need. He says his real need is to get his sins forgiven. If he gets his sins forgiven, he'll have eternal life. Jesus doesn't even, at the moment, seem to be primarily focused upon his physical needs. Now, of course, Jesus does care about our needs. He cares about our bodies. He cares about us being fit and well. But here, he says, no, I'm keeping this in line with what I'm preaching about. He needs his sins forgiven. But he says an amazing thing. Knowing the murmuring that's going on in the room, he says, but so that you may know that the Son of Man, and he's speaking about himself there, so that you may know the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he says, this is what I'm going to do. Because Jesus needs us to know that he's able to forgive our sins. He needs us to know that he's able to do something very special. He says to the man, I tell you, rise, take your mat, and walk. <laughs> now, Jesus doesn't grab him and say, come on, you will get up. He doesn't get a hoist or a winch. He says, you stand up. Stand up with the faith that I know you have. Get up. And he watches. And the man has the faith to be able to stand up. Jesus wasn't going to heal his body, but he looks to the room and says, if you need a kind of proof of what I can do in the spiritual realm, then this is it. Watch what I've done with this man's body and then believe that I can do the same thing with his sins. If that's what it takes for you to believe, then I'm happy to do it. The man has two healings that day. He has a healing of his body. He's going to live 20, 30, 40 more years. He'll die again, but he's now going to enter into a new kind of life. But more importantly, that very moment, because his sins were forgiven, he was resurrected into eternal life from that moment. The moment his sins were forgiven, he became a friend of God and would be with God forever. <clears throat> Joel is going to carry on our story. So as you can see, um, we make a big deal about this Easter thing, don't we? Uh, we get dressed up. I, I, uh, I usually don't look this purty. 
we sing special songs, we, we put up balloons and decorations, and, and uh, this, this is the most attended Sunday all over the world than the, all the rest of the year. And uh, we actually want to talk about this idea of what is the big deal with the resurrection? Why is it that we make such a such, uh, 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 ruha about it, if you would? And, and, and really, the, the main idea of why this is such a big deal, Malcolm was just shared with this. You see, it would be, it's easy for me to come here and stand before you and say, listen, God came and spoke to me. And this is what he said. He said that uh, he is preeminent, um, but he's really proud of me. And he really would like you guys to follow me, give to me, right? And it's really easy for me to say that. It's really easy for someone to say, which a lot of religions are based on this. I was off in the desert and I was all alone and an angel showed up and he dictated me all these holy books and here they are, follow me. That's easy to say. And here we have a situation where Jesus says to somebody, hey, your sins are forgiven. Now, that might be a great idea. That might be something that he might need it. Jesus might have looked down and saw, you know what, this guy doesn't really want to be healed. He feels like he's here because he deserved it. I don't know. But he says your sins are forgiven. And, 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 there's, some, and there's some folks that are like, Okay, a little disappointed because like Malcolm was saying. And then there's other folks who are saying, wait a second, who are you? Only God can forgive sins. What makes Jesus different in this aspect is that he said, get up and walk. What makes Jesus different in, in our aspect is there's an empty tomb. Joseph Smith of the Mormons is in his tomb. Muhammad is in his tomb. Buddha is in his tomb. On and on and on and on. All these folks, to the, to their, to the omission of their own followers, they died and were buried. The unique thing about those of us that are gathering around this central idea is we say the tomb is empty. We believe that the that the the. As a matter of fact, I think this is the central question. Now, listen, I don't know why you're here today, right? Someone invited you, and you're like, you, didn't, you were too embarrassed to say no. You've told them no several times, and you couldn't get out of it, right? You were about to say no, but your wife said, no, we're free. And you're like, <laughs> But you may come with, uh, with, with tons of questions about, you know, well, what about you know, Christianity's history and persecuting this? And what about their belief here? And, and all, all great questions. We don't have enough time. Be, I'm more than happy to sit down when you talk through some of those. But what I would say today is today there is a fundamental question that's more important than all that, and that is, was the tomb empty? Did Jesus really raise from the dead? A matter of fact, Paul says this himself. He gives an out. He gives you an out. You never have to come back again. So you better listen to this. Okay? You got dragged here. Listen to this. I'm giving you your out. Right? Paul says this himself in his letters to the Corinthians, his first letter, he says this, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ, Christ is uh, another title for Jesus. Jesus, uh, it's the Latin form of Yeshua, which is the Hebrew name. God saves. And when it says Christ, it's the expected hero that was to come. So if this expected hero, if this Messiah, if this Christ has not been raised, he says, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Mark it. Live by it. If, Jesus, if this tomb was not empty, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, we're wasting our time. You got another Sunday back. If you're just visiting, if you're, if you're not a visitor, you come every Sunday, you got all your Sundays back. You know, no longer have to worry about, you know, when, you know, church conflicts with a good football game. If Jesus did not raise from the dead. So let's spend a little time on this question about the resurrection. Did it really happen? Because if it didn't happen, so long, farewell, good riddance. We're just like everybody else who kind of came up with a good idea and thought this is a good religious way to live your life, right? To kind of control you. And so I could, you know, make 
all the wonderful money I'm making in the Bay Area as a pastor. <laughs> but if it did happen, then this is possible for us. Then the alcoholic and the drug addict and the anger addict and the selfish addict and the lost can be found. So I just want to consider a few que questions quickly, okay? I'm not going to go through it all. We don't have, again, we don't have time, and Malcolm was the halfway point. So I'm, it's not like he was the warm-up, and now you're getting the good thing. We're working on this together, all right? First question, was Jesus really crucified and laid into a tomb? In other words, if Jesus never really existed, he's just a mythical person, right? Then we don't even have to consider the tomb. If he, if, he didn't really, if he didn't really exist, then uh, if you have any kind of scientific, really want to know the truth, you can't even ask this question anymore. I mean, you can ask it. It's fine to ask it. Don't get me wrong. But um, the only folks who still ha are kind of behind this thing, well, Jesus is just this legend kind of folks, are conspiracy theorists, not historians. The, histori uh, the historicity of Jesus and that he lived, that he spoke uh, much of the words that he spoke, that he had the impact he did, that people actually followed him, and that he was, that he was crucified. That's not even, that's not, that's not even in, in question. And, and the fact that he was crucified really isn't a question e uh, either. Now, I will tell you this. There, there are some noticeable exceptions. There have been some challenges to that. In the 18th century, uh, someone uh, was dictated to by an angel, one person in private, no witnesses, one angel, one time said, here's the Quran. And the Quran actually says that Jesus, that God would never allow his son, his prophet, they see Jesus as a prophet, to be crucified. People, now, here's the deal. People thought that that happened. It was like a mind meld Jedi thing. But Jesus really went to India and died later there. Again, though, that was never even put forth till the 18th century in the Quran. And then in the 20th century, guys, um, uh, skeptics, if you would, uh, kind of say, hey, you know what? Um, Karl Barth and Karl Venturini said, you know what? The resurrection, he, he just kind of pretended. He, he really just fainted on the cross from exhaustion. Or he was given some kind of special drug that made him look like he was dead. And by the way, ho hold on, ho hold on. Some of this could be, I don't know about the fainting part, but the, but the, the drug that makes you look like dead, I, I know some folks in Haiti that, that, that they've actually done, they do that. They've actually used a, a, a little serum from the puffer fish, makes them look like they're dead, they bury them, and then they look like they raise them back to life. So it is theoretically possible. The problem with that is that, well, first of all, both those theories only have to be theories because they accept a truth. You don't try to explain away that Jesus didn't really die if you didn't really believe that he was seen later. So keep that in the back of your mind. Second of all, the other thing is that if you accept the history of, of the cross, well, then it's not just a matter of did he really die. You have to explain how did he survive the scourging, the crucifixion itself, the fact that they put a spear in his side, and then three days later, he just shows up with a couple of scars and a good attitude. So even if he did just faint, even if they did kind of give him this stuff, all the other realities suggest he doesn't just show up, like I say, with a couple of scars and a good attitude. As a matter of fact, the, honestly, the, the question about whether or not Jesus really died is not a historical question. It's a theological question. It's only folks who are trying to undercut the theology, the, the idea. But historians who study history, who look at conclusive evidence of, of what, is, what is really true and what is not, they don't question that Jesus is a real person that was really crucified, especially because we have two secular historians, one of them, by the way, a Jew, who would be completely anti-anything in terms of regards to Jesus. 
both Tacticus and Josephus wrote that Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate. It was an accepted fact. So was the tomb really empty then? Okay, so he died and he was buried. But he could have just never, maybe he just didn't raise the dead. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just legend, right? I mean, come on, haven't you heard this theory that, that uh, Christianity, you know, it wasn't anything like it is that it is today, that hundreds of years later, the Christians got together in these secret councils and they said, hey, you know what? Let's come up with a, way, a, a reason to explain the why we're suffering so much, why we're being persecuted, why they're throwing us to the lions and stuff. And we'll say that Jesus rose from the dead. And, and this is just kind of this legend kind of, kind of a spread kind of a thing. Right? I'm sure, I, trust me, you YouTube it, you will find somebody on YouTube right now on the internet that will tell you that very theory. Again, the problem is they're not historians. They haven't done their research at all. At all, excuse me. I don't know why I'm talking to a board. The, 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 but the, the burial story that's recorded in Mark um, is recorded so early. In other words, it happened in the time of people that were around at that time. The, the Bible actually says it gives the specific name, Joseph of Arimathea, who wasn't just some average Joe. He was part of the head, he was part of the Jewish Kai Council. It's really simple. If, if I said to everybody, so-and-so was buried, and uh, we buried him in the, in the tomb of um, Donald Trump, Whoa. Charlie Porzio, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I named the specific person. All you do is go to the person and go, did you really? Did you offer the tomb? Did they really? And the person go, oh, no way. Or everybody else could go, you know what? Jesus, we know what happened to Jesus. What happened to every other criminal was they were just thrown into this mass grave. Usually left open for a while, by the way, as a message to the Jews. Don't mess with the Romans. But the fact is, 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 that, is that during the, it was established during the lifetime of those that were there that they could have easily refute it. He was never buried in a tomb. And it was, never, it was, it was not empty. Listen, but, um, 1 Corinthians, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8. The verses will come up on the screen. Paul says this to them. He says, For what I received, I pass on to you as a first importance. This is important. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After he appeared more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep, he then appeared to James, who was a skeptic, by the way, during Christ's actual lifetime, then to all the apostles, and last he appeared to me, who was the ultimate skeptic, Paul, as the one who had normally born. Okay, so let's just kind of look at this really quickly, all right? What he says is, I received you what was passed on to me. When was it passed on to him? When Paul visited the disciples after his own conversion. That's within seven years of Christ's death. That's when they passed it on. It was already an established formula. As a matter of fact, if you read the New Testament at all, you'll find from the very beginning, the very first sermon was, Jesus died, you killed him, and he's, and he's alive. And so there was no time, anyone who knows the his, history, this is, by the way, what converted C.S. Lewis. Look it up, it's fact. He, he was a secular atheistic scholar who, is, who, who studied how legends and stories grew, which is why he was such a phenomenal writer. Him and Tolkien together, you know, they were in a group together, both Christians. And, and he just thought the Bible was a bunch of stories, and someone challenged him, apply your, your mind to this fact. And he went and looked at it and went, this can't be legend. There's too many, too many specifics. There's too many negative things. For instance, if it was legend, the people who first saw Jesus would not be women. Now, okay, give me a break here. Okay, I'm talking about a different time and a different area. I'm talking about history. Okay? God obviously knows from the get-go the women are smarter than men. That's why the women saw it. Okay? <laughs> but from a historical perspective, at the time... Not saying it was right, but at the time, 
A woman's testimony would not be proper in its court of law. It could not establish fact at all. And so if, I, if we were making up a legend, women would not have found Jesus. It would have been somebody else. Somebody educated, a male who with high, Joseph of Arimathea would have been a perfect person if I'm writing a legend. But the details there do not add up to legend status. The facts do not add up to legend status. And then what even makes this worse, and this is Paul's point. Paul says, listen, these people have seen this. He names them. There's Peter and the, and the 12, not only the 11 that originally followed Jesus, but even the 12th disciple they decided on later. There's many people that had seen Jesus and they knew their names. Right? He says there's more than 500 folks. You can go talk to them. There's, there's James, his, his half-brother, who, by the way, was skeptical and did not believe him. It was converted later. And then there's me. I saw him alive afterwards as well. And they named names. So during this time, it would have been really simple for anyone to go to one of those folks and say, come on, really? Did he really raise from the dead? Did he? Now, okay, listen. His followers claimed that he was dead, but real, or that he was risen, but he really wasn't, right? In other words, the question you have to ask is, did someone take the body? All right, so we'll, g we'll give you this, all right? So we understand that history says, right? Actually, let me, let me just go back one point. You can keep on this slide, but let me just go back one point. The other thing that's really interesting is when the disciples go around saying the tomb was empty, the, the Romans, who were tired of Christians, ultimately blamed them, remember, of the burning of Jerusalem. And the Jews, who were tired of Christians, because they were teaching something other than their own faith, neither one of them said, you're idiots! We'll take you to the tomb! They both said, no, 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 no. The soldiers fell asleep and the disciples stole the body. Why did they have to come up with a story? Because the tomb was empty. You don't have to come up with a story. If the, if you can just say... This is ridiculous. Let me just take you there. His body, the bones are still there. No, they had to come up with a story. All right, so someone took the body. That's, that is the most logical explanation. Now, obviously, again, the Romans didn't take the body. The Jews didn't take the body. Those that were following the Jewish faith at that, at that point, on top of the ethnicity, because all the Christians at that point were Jewish. They didn't come up with it. So it had to have been the disciples. The disciples had to have taken the body. Now here's the problem. There have been many folks who have made up their own religion, right? And have lied about, or they were deluded, okay? Okay, but there are some unique things when you're comparing the two. And by the way, you should ask that question about every religion. First of all, most of these religions, as I always mentioned, is based on the testimony of one person, and so they could have literally had a hallucination and just seen it. The problem is when you're talking about 500 and some odd people, right? Anyone who knows anything about the mind and hallucinations, and especially since they didn't all see them at once, no. Matter of fact, uh, uh, most scholars would say it's more of a miracle that 500 and some odd folks had the same hallucination than it was that Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> So you go back, you look at these folks' lives. Now, the other thing we know about religions that are made up is generally this is what happens. It's scattered, it has a few followers, they make up the religion, and, they, and then it grows. And they get richer, and they get more influential, and all of a sudden, they have a stake in protecting the lie. The problem with these 500 and some odd is for them, life got worse and not better. Their lie didn't help them. Matter of fact, those who were doctors ahead of time, those like Paul who had a high position and were all of a sudden their lives got worse. And yet, the 500 some odd folks who said that they saw Jesus, there is not one, not one single record that anyone recanted. And some of them were, were literally died saying, he rose, he rose, he rose. Now, I'm not talking about, listen, there are people today that are dying because they believe if, if they you know, go and bomb someone, they're going to go to glory, right? But they're, but they're doing it based on what someone else told them. 
That happens all the time. But that's different than what you know to be true. It's different if you're, if you're the source and you know that it's a lie for you to die for it. As a matter of fact, very interesting. Uh, you should, uh, sometime you have a little extra time, you should look into the life of Chuck Colson from Prison Fellowship International. Uh, he served as a special counsel president. He was the first one to go to jail for the whole Nixon thing, right? And he actually writes that the reason he came to Christ was because of Watergate. He says, because ultimately he said, um, him and Elickman and Haldeman and Mitchell, they were passionate about the president. They had all these benefits. But when it came down to their livelihood, when it came down to their reputation and whatnot, every single one of them threw the president under the bus. And then he says this, this will come up on the screen. What does this have to do with the resurrection? Simply, says Chuck Colson, Watergate demonstrates human nature. No one can ever make me believe that 11 ordinary human beings would for 40 years endure persecution, beatings, prison, and death without ever once renouncing that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. It's ludicrous. So they absolutely believed that he rose from the dead. And historians that look at this go, even, by the way, atheistic historians, there, there are folks that are, that are scientific that look at this and say one thing that we know for sure, Jesus existed, he died, he was buried, and the disciples believed that he rose from the dead. That leaves us with three options. Number one, they were lying. You just go ahead and apply the principle any way you think. That's some lie that every single one of them is willing to suffer and die for it. Every single one of them could improve their lives if they just went, nah, we're just kidding. They, they hallucinated. Again, do the research. Do the research. Or they really saw the risen Christ. So here's my question. If Jesus rose from the dead, what does that mean to me? What does that mean to me? Now, listen, I don't think I emphatically just answered the question for you. Like, wait, duh, of course you're going to believe it now. All I'm saying is this. You better answer the question. You're not being intellectually honest with yourself. You're, 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 you're not being open to what, true, what, what is truth if you don't at least answer the question and seek it out. And, it, and if you believe that tomb was empty, it changes everything. Because now when Jesus says... I forgive your sins. When now Jesus says, you must suffer for me. By the way, we're not one of those churches that says, listen, accept this Jesus deal and the American dream will come true for you. I'm not selling you that. But what I am telling you is this. If Jesus rose from the dead, then what he did for this guy, what he says in the Bible he'll do for you, in you, through you, and ultimately through eternity, all of a sudden becomes possible and probable. That might be something worth investigating. As a matter of fact, um, there have been several folks that began to investigate this question and it has changed their very lives. One of them uh, is a guy by the name of Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was the investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. You don't get more skeptical than that. He was an atheist, and his wife becomes a Christian, and rather than fighting her, he goes into investigative mode and spends two years saying, all I got to disprove is one thing. Jesus did not raise from the dead. Lee Stroll is a flaming follower of Jesus. And he wrote out his, his, the facts. He wrote out this process in a book called The Case for Easter as well as The Case for Christ. So this is, what I'm, this is what I'll tell you, okay? If you are really authentically interested, you want to know for yourself, I'll buy you the book. All you need to do is write down on the little communication card that came in your bulletin, write down that on it, your name, and just on the back, write book. That's it. B-O-O-K, book. And next week, I'll have the book for you. I'll have your name on it. It'll be sitting back there. If you want to put, you don't have to, but if you want to put your email down, 
We'll email and let you know that it's here. I'll buy it if you're willing to look at it. There is a lot more that we're going to talk about. This, we're, the resurrection for us isn't just a one-day thing. We're going, there's more to this, this topic. And so for the next four weeks, we're going to look at the, what's the big deal about the resurrection. We're going to look at things like what it says about what God is like. What it says about what, uh, why does Jesus matter to me in the first place? Personally to me. What, does God really care about me? Okay, so all this happened, but does he really care? I mean, I look around this world. I look at my life. And what is new life and when does it start? We're going to ask and answer these questions. So I invite you to join us in that. And last but not uh, least, as the worship team kind of comes up and begins to set up, um, we do a podcast just a very short kind of thing that, that kind of takes us through the scriptures. And so starting tomorrow, we're going to start through the book of John. All right, you'll find the readings in your uh, reading schedule. Though it's really simple. Tomorrow's the first day, so it's John 1. And the second day is John 2. You, you kind of get it from there, right? And then after reading that, uh, I'll highlight just one aspect of that. You can kind of go online and uh, listen to the podcast. And I would just encourage you, if, you, if you're a skeptic, that's fine. There's a lot of folks here that are skeptical. And we have a lot of scientists that were really skeptical. We think this is a good place to be skeptical, as long as you're honestly skeptical. Or maybe, maybe you just need a little bit more to your fa- oomph to your faith, if you would. I would just encourage you to kind of lean in on this. All right. You pray with me. Father God... A lot of words can lead to a lot of folly. And so I just pray those things that you want folks to hear, they they may hear. Stir that in them. In Jesus' name, amen.